I'm Kat and today I have for you a word in Romanian and also a true crime case Halloween edition. So let's start with the word. The word for you today is Otrava. Otrava. O tra v. Otrava. Well done guys, you just said poison. Marianne Cotton, Northeast's most notorious poisoner which shocked County Durham village was finally caught in July 1872. It's believed that she killed up to 21 people including three of her four husbands and 11 of her 13 children. She had more victims than Jack the Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe and the Moore's murderers. But it was the death of her stepson Charles Edward Cotton that finally got her captured when she was arrested in her house in West Oakland's Front Street. So let's learn more about Marianne Cotton. Marianne Cotton was born on October 31st, 1832 as Marianne Robson in Low Moorsley, Durham County, northeast of England. She grew up there and according to some sources, she left home when she was 16 years old. Marianne's childhood started out normal enough in Low Moorsley. Her parents were devout Methodists and her father, Michael Robson, was a sinker involved in the horrible and often dangerous waterlogged job of sinking shafts for new coal mines. Around 1839, when Marianne was six years old, her family moved from Moorsley to the nearby Pitt village of Merton. With a population of 98, in 1831 it rose rapidly into the thousand as the century progressed. Merton was one of many emerging coal mines villages that came into being in eastern Durham following the establishment of Hatton Colliery in 1822. The colliery marked the beginning of the deep mining in East Durham and Wareside, where the coal was deep beneath the magnesium limestone cliffs. Only a few years after the move to Merton, Marianne's father tragically fell to his death down a colliery shaft. He was only 30 years old. Whether this affected Marianne mentally in a damaging way is quite impossible to say, but deaths in the mine were quite common incidents that many families had to deal with. Marianne's mother Margaret stayed in Morton after the death of her husband and she kept lodgers which helped her support Marianne. At the age of 16, Marianne left home because it's believed that she didn't get on very well with her mother's new husband, a minor called George Scott. Marianne went to work as a nurse for a local man at South Hatton and then returned to her mother's house in Morton after three years to train as a dressmaker. Marianne was at the time described as strikingly beautiful. In 1852, when Marianne was 20 years old, after she fell pregnant, she married William Mowbray in Newcastle. William was a colliery laborer. The couple then moved to Cornwall, living close to the river Tamar, not far from Plymouth, in the neighboring county of Devon. They stayed with Irish navies, with William working on the railway as a shop steward. The work involved constant moving from place to place as the railway advanced across Cornwall. It's possible they learned of prospects there from one of their Merton neighbors back in County Durham. Merton was known for being home to a very significant number of Cornish miners who settled there after they were forced into strike breaking work. A strike breaker is a person who works despite an ongoing strike. They are usually not employed by the company before the trade union dispute, but they are hired after or during the strike to keep the organization running. During their time in Cornwall, Marianne gave birth to either four or five children. Marianne wasn't sure of how many. Of those children, only one, a girl named Margaret, survived beyond the first few days. This kind of early deaths in children at that time were not unusual and there is no implication that Marianne was involved in their deaths. It could be that maybe these events were the ones that really damaged her psychologically. 
Eventually, Mary Ann and William Mowbray were persuaded to return from Cornwall by Mary Ann's mother, where sadly their baby girl Margaret died from scarlet fever in 1860. On return to the Northeast, Mary Ann's husband, William Mowbray, found work as a foreman at South Hatton Colliery and then went on to work as a stoker on a steam vessel. The work brought William and Mary Ann to the Dockland area of Hendon and the east end of Sunderland, an area known for its pubs, sailors and brothels, so it wasn't a really nice area to live in. In Hendon, Mary and William would have two further children. The children were named Isabella and Margaret and they both survived for the time being. In the meantime, with her husband usually away from home, Mary Ann formed a relationship with a red-headed coal miner called Joseph Natris of Seaham Harbor. She fell pregnant most likely with Joseph's child and the baby called John Mowbray was born at Hendon and baptized at South Hedon, died a few days after baptism, apparently from gastric fever in September 1864. William, Marianne's husband, at one point took out a life insurance policy that covered both him and their three surviving children. The other children apparently had died from gastric fever, a common illness. Around a year later, William Mowbray, Marianne's first husband, died of typhus or gastric fever. There are some conflicting information out there. Marianne received the insurance of 35 pounds following his death, the equivalent to half a year's wage. Mary Ann then moved to Seaham Harbor with her two daughters, one of whom Margaret died soon after. This would be the second child named Margaret who died. The remaining daughter Isabella went to live with Mary Ann's mother. Mary Ann's relationship with her lover Joseph may have continued for longer but he was engaged to someone else and after he got married Mary Ann left Seaham and found work as a hospital nurse in Sunderland. There Mary Ann formed a relationship with a patient called George Ward who like William was a stoker. They married in August 1865 at Monkwearmouth. The patient George later became ill and died in 1866. Once again, Mary Ann collected the insurance money. This would have been from her second husband. A death certificate gave cholera and typhoid as the cause of George's death, even though doctors were quite confused by some of the symptoms that he had displayed. So remember, now we have two husbands that died from gastric fever and Mary Ann collected the money from both of their insurances. In December 1866, Mary Ann found work as a housekeeper. After replying to a job ad posted by a recently widowed shipyard worker in the Pallion area of Sunderland called James Robinson. James Robinson was the father of five children and he really needed female assistance. Only one day after Mary Ann started working for him, his newborn baby by his late wife died of gastric fever. During 1867, Mary Ann heard news that her 54-year-old mother, who was still the guardian of Mary Ann's daughter Isabella, was feeling unwell. Mary Ann went to visit her at Seaham. Her mother started to make a recovery, but the recovery was soon accompanied by stomach pains and she lost her life only nine days after Mary Ann went to visit her. When Mary Ann left Seaham, her stepfather, George Scott, told her to take Isabella, her daughter, with her. At this time, around February 1867, Mary Ann was already pregnant by James Robinson when she returned to the Robinson household in Sunderland with her daughter Isabella. Within the space of four days, in April 1867, another two children of James Robinson died, six-year-old James and eight-year-old Elizabeth. Another six days would pass and then, on April 30th, 1867, Mary Ann's own daughter, Isabella Mowbray, by then aged around seven years old, also died. This must have been an extremely difficult time for James Robinson, but in August, to avoid an illegal birth of their forthcoming child, remember that Mary Ann is pregnant at this point, 
Mary Ann and James got married at Bishop Wormout. Bishop Wormout. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing these names right. Their child was born in November 1867 and was named Mary Isabella. Sadly, Mary Isabella became ill and died in March of the following year. In June 1869, a second child was born to the couple, a baby boy called George. James Robinson then discovered that Mary Ann was stealing from his bank account and that she was encouraging his surviving children to pawn his belongings to pay off her debt. It's not known what Mary Ann was spending the money on as there was no sign that she bought anything around the house. It still remains a mystery why she needed those money so desperately. James Robinson threw Mary Ann out of his house which was a life-saving decision for him to make because he would be the only one of Mary's husbands to outlive her. Mary Ann took the baby, George, with her, keeping him for a short while. She then later handed George over to a friend while she went to post a letter, but Mary Ann didn't return. George was returned to his father, who maintained custody of the child. For a while, Mary Ann was destitute, and it's not clear what she did with her life at this point, before making contact with an old friend called Margaret Cotton, an unmarried woman in South Haddon also known as a spinster, I think. Margaret told Marianne about her brother, Frederick Cotton, a recently widowed miner who lived at Warbottle near Newcastle. Frederick suffered a lot of tragedy, having lost his wife and two of his children. Marianne, possibly thinking that he was another potential victim, she wanted, of course, to meet him. Soon, Marianne struck up a friendship with Frederick Cotton and after offering him comfort in her usual way, she moved in with him. Mary Ann then learned that Frederick would receive the sum of 60 pounds from the death of his sister Margaret, Mary Ann's friend, the one that introduced her to him. Within four weeks of Mary Ann moving in with the Cottons, Margaret Cotton, who was caring for her brother's children, was dead. A few weeks later, Mary Ann fell pregnant again, this time with Frederick Cotton's child. In September 1870, the two got married at St. Andrew's Church in Gallowgate, Newcastle. Of course, that Frederick Cotton didn't know that Mary Ann was already married. She later gave birth to a son. In 1871, the couple left Warbottle with their new baby boy Robert, along with Frederick's two children, Frederick Jr. and Charles. They moved to West Oakland in South Durham, which is said to have been Mary Ann's choice. There, they found themselves living in the same street as Mary Ann's old lover, Joseph Natris, with whom Mary Ann once again rekindled her affair. In September 1871, Mary Ann's husband, Frederick Cotton, became ill and died just two weeks later. Mary Ann was left to look after the three boys. Again, Mary Ann apparently received an insurance payout. She received relief payment for two of the boys, Frederick Jr. and Charles, as they were not her children. Further financial help came in the form of a lodger, Joseph Natris, her lover, who moved in with them. During his stay, Joseph became committed in his relationship to Mary Ann as he was persuaded to change his will in Mary Ann's favor. It was around this time that Mary Ann started working as a nurse for an excise man called Mr. John Quick Manning. He seems to have worked for a local brewery. He was recovering from smallpox and she began nursing him back to health. He was a much wealthier prospect than Joseph Natris, her lover. In 1872, Joseph, the lover, also died, leaving his modest belongings to Marianne. She then allegedly told the local parish official, Thomas Riley, that she couldn't marry John Quick Manning because of her seven-year-old stepson, Charles Edward Cotton. By some reports, Mary Ann was already pregnant with John. Mary Ann had asked for Thomas's help to nurse a woman who was sick with smallpox and that's when she complained about Charles, the stepson, being in the way and if he could be committed to the workhouse. Thomas Riley, the parish official who also served as West Oakland's assistant coroner, 
told Marianne that she would have to accompany Charles to the workhouse. She also told Thomas that the boy was sickly and added, quote, I won't be troubled long. He'll go like all the rest of the cottons, end of quote. Five days later, Marianne told Thomas that Charles had died. Suspicious, seeing Charles the previous days when he didn't appear ill at all, Thomas went to the village police and convinced the doctor to delay writing a death certificate until the circumstances could be investigated. Mary Ann's first stop after Charles's death was not the doctor's office, but the insurance office. There she discovered that, that no money would be paid out until a death certificate was issued. An inquest was held into her stepson's death in the Rose and Crown Inn on West Oakland's front street, next door to Mary Ann Cotton's home. But this proved inconclusive and the jury returned a verdict of natural causes. Marianne claimed to have used arrowroot to relieve his illness and said that Thomas Riley had made accusations against her because she rejected his advances. Then the local newspapers picked up onto the story and discovered that Marianne had moved around northern England and lost three husbands, a lover, a friend, her mother and a dozen children, all of whom had died of stomach fevers. Rumor turned to suspicion and then a forensic inquiry. The doctor who attended Charles had kept samples and they tested positive for arsenic. He went to the police who arrested Marianne on July 18, 1872 for the murder of Charles Cotton and ordered the exhumation of his body. She was charged with his murder, but the trial was delayed until after the delivery of her 13th and final child in Durham jail on 10th of January, 1873. An examination finally revealed the presence of arsenic in her stepson's stomach. Finding this out, authorities also exhumed the bodies of Joseph Natras, remember his lover, and two other cotton children, and they were all determined to have been poisoned with arsenic. Marianne was finally charged with the murder of Charles Edward Cotton, and while she was in jail, a daughter was born in January 1873. The baby, who was her 13th child, and another of her children were the only ones to survive their mother. Marianne's trial began two months later at Durham Crown Court and lasted three days. The defense claimed that the victims had inhaled arsenic dust from wallpaper dye, which at the time was a plausible explanation given that arsenic was common in many household items at the time. However, the prosecution's evidence, especially the other arsenic-related deaths, proved overwhelming and Marianne was convicted and sentenced to death. She was found guilty of Charles's murder and responsible for the deaths by poisoning of 11 of her children, three husbands, one lover and her own mother. The court heard how she lived off her husbands before eventually claiming their estates. The 40-year-old was described at the time as a monster in human shape by the Newcastle Chronicle. On 24th of March 1873, Marianne was hanged in a botched execution. It was performed by a notoriously clumsy hangman and the trapdoor was not positioned high enough to break her neck, forcing the executioner to press down on her shoulders. Three minutes passed before she eventually died. She died from strangulation. The execution hood over her face was allegedly splattered with blood apparently from her lungs as she frothed desperate for air. Several witnesses were reported as being visibly disturbed as they watched her die. She died in front of 50 observers. She was buried in the grounds of Durham jail. Mary Ann never confessed to any of the deaths and the number of her victims is not exactly known, but many sources believe that she killed as many as 21 people. While it was claimed that she was Britain's first female serial killer, other women had previously been hanged for poisoning multiple people. However, Mary Ann was regarded as the country's deadliest killer until Harold Shipman, who was believed to have murdered as many as 260 people in the late 20th century. Mary Ann would buy the arsenic which was used like disinfectant in those days from the chemist opposite her house. It's believed that she used tea poisoned with arsenic to kill her victims and the teapot she used is at Beamish Museum. 
The small black Wedgwood teapot was donated to Beamish in 1972, but its provenance was unknown until 1989 when the museum received a letter from the daughter of the donor. It revealed that the GP who donated the teapot had inherited the teapot via his stepmother from his step-grandmother who had been given the teapot by Mary Ann Cotton. The County Durham Museum owner said he had never felt comfortable with ownership of the relic and was persuaded by his family to send it to Beamish. Also on show is a stool which is believed to have belonged to Marianne Cotton while she waited for her trial in Durham jail. A number of photocopies of letters have also been sent to the museum anonymously. The museum said they had been sold to a dealer by a North Yorkshire auction house in 2013 and their present owner had bought them online. Another batch of Marianne Cotton's letters found in her prison cell sold for £1,050 in September 2016. And finally, finally, over 100 years later, in the early 1990s, when Durham Jail was being modernized, the graves of some of those executed were disturbed, including that of Marianne Cotton. A pair of shoes belonging to her were found, along with her bones. The bodies were removed and all were later cremated. Now... Going to the bench, Mary Ann lived in two properties in West Oakland. The most well-known still stands overlooking the village greenery on Front Street and this was the last house she lived in before she was arrested. She also killed her last victim there. It's less known the house she lived in before moving to Front Street. This house was number 20 Johnson Terrace. The terrace has since been demolished and is now the site of one of the main routes into the village known as Darlington Road. Here stands a bench backed by a playing field and allotments. Local tales suggest that the bench is placed exactly where 20 Johnson Terrace once stood. Stories suggest that the bench has a dark presence surrounding it. A chill has been felt in the air even on the sunniest of days. Sometimes while sitting there people have reported seeing the ghosts of victims playing on the grass surrounding it. And this is the story of Mary Ann Cotton, the haunted bench and Britain's first female serial killer. And I shall leave you with a spooky spooky thing at the end. Children from the Northeast would recite a chilling nursery rhyme. I found a version of it and I'm playing it for you now. And I shall see you in the next video, which is going to be the last video of the Halloween season. For now, take care, stay safe. And I'll see you in the next video. Don't go anywhere because the nursery rhyme is going to play for you if YouTube is not giving me any copyright issues. Bye! Is powers and